So um, a couple of comments. First uh, comment is <clears throat> every, every other topic that, I've, that I'm talking about, and I think for Mark, every topic that he's talking about, he's written a paper on every topic that he's talking about, and I've written a paper on every other topic that I'm talking about, or multiple papers on every other topic that I'm talking about, but I've never written a paper on this stuff. So this is kind of an outsider's view, and um, but we did the best we could to try to figure out ways of not having to talk about DSGE econometrics in this. But then we kept thinking, well, supposed to be what's new in econometrics time series for the last ten years, and this is definitely something that's new and very, very interesting. And I've certainly learned a lot um, preparing this, but at the same time, I, I would especially if, if I'm getting something wrong or making some nuance errors or if there's something that you disagree with, I would urge you to speak up here. Um, I should also say I um, owe a lot of thanks to Anna Makushova who helped me with a number of things and some simulations that we'll see at the end. Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, motivation for this. Uh, which has already, I think, been laid out reasonably well. I'm going to talk about um, a, a bit about the model setup and model solution, but the main purpose here is to talk about the econometrics. Um, uh, I'm, there, are, there are people who are experts on the particulars of model solution algorithms, and that's a, an interesting, actually, it's a mathematically and computationally interesting area. Uh, It's highly specialized and highly technical, and I don't think that's an appropriate topic for this um, uh, more general audience. So I'm going to focus on the uh, econometric issues uh, that come up. And there are really a number of very interesting ones, um, and I think there's a lot that is, some that is known, a lot that is not known, and there's a lot of interesting research to be done. Okay, Um, so... <clears throat> in, in the grand sweep of things, the DSGE models are, I guess, the new version of the uh, models that were developed as a result of the Coles Commission work, which is to see if we can bring economic theory to bear to provide some structured way to look at um, empirical relationships in the world. And, um, and this, the important part of this and the major breakthrough that's occurred uh, in the last few years or the last decade or so is being able to take what are at one point were very stylized, very uh, simple models, and being able to push them through in terms of a level of sophistication and computation so that these models are now something that you can actually take to the data and estimate and assess empirically uh, by a number of uh, by a number of different measures. Um, some of the uh, I mean, the reasons why you'd want to be using uh, some sort of structured model, I think, are reasonably obvious to, to all of us, which is that they're a framework for, um, for making policy recommendations, asking counterfactual policy questions, for solving for optimal policy rules. You know, one thing that in the VAR context, the best that we'd be able to do is say, what's, a, what's the effect of this shock where the Fed sort of by mistake uh, raises interest rates by 30 more basis points because of a typographical error uh, in transmission of the instructions. And that's, you know, that's one policy question you could ask, but that certainly isn't um, the only policy question, and probably in a deep sense is maybe the not the most interesting policy question. The most interesting policy questions are what are the monetary policy rules or the structure of uh, the way that the Fed approaches its work um, in, in terms of uh, thinking about optimal performance. And those are questions that you need more structure than a VAR uh, to answer, um, or at least uh, uh, I'd, I'd say to answer compellingly. I, that's, that's not completely fair because there are certainly attempts to answer those questions in VARs. Um, but, but, I, but I think the, doing that in a completely articulated economic model is, uh, is, is, is very appealing. Um, you can also make conditional forecasts from this, although you can use a lot of models to make conditional forecasts. Um, as it says here, I think the, the big breakthrough has been, as I mentioned, the big breakthrough has been able uh, of providing uh, been the development of techniques that allow us to compute these models, uh, to e- compute their likelihoods, or to compute moments from these models, to estimate them, uh, and, uh, and to solve out these models. <clears throat> 
and, and to do that in the context of some, some large-scale things. The, you know, the notable um, recent um, couple of important works is the Ireland and especially the smets Wouters paper that uh, was able to take a really pretty large model uh, to the data. Um, okay, so... Uh, so we're going to be looking at, um, in this talk, just the econometrics, estimation and inference associated with DSGE modeling. So, um, so I'm going to focus on linearized systems and linearized models, uh, just because that's what um, the vast majority of uh, the literature uh, is about. Um, so uh, here's the uh, general methodology, uh, the general DSGE methodology. You, so you specify some nonlinear optimization model. So you set out some economic model with optimization in it um, and uh, various budget constraint type things. Uh, you obtain the Euler equations. Uh, you log linearize it. Uh, you solve out the model, which is to say you solve out the expectations. The expectations in the model are going to be rational expectations, which are determined endogenously within the model. You can solve those out. Um, in particular, if you've log linearized, it's a, a rel there's a variety of algorithms for that. Um, and then you can put these um, solved out models into state space form. At that point, so this is all, uh, this, these first five items are uh, what I would think of as the work of the macro modelers and the model specification. Um, at this point, once you've put a model into state space form, uh, you're at a situation where you can start to do a number of different um, estimation things. I should mention, and we'll talk about this, you can do estimation at the point of Euler equations, although to manipulate, to do, to do much interesting stuff, you then will still need to solve out uh, the model, but, although you can estimate the Euler equations without actually log linearizing them. Um, <clears throat> so there's a variety of estimation uh, options, uh, moment matching, GMM, uh, maximum likelihood, and Bayes methods. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, inference and evaluation. Okay. So uh, there's a couple of good recent um, references on this. There's a textbook uh, or monographs, I guess, by uh, Canova and then another one by DeJong and uh, Dave. And then uh, Larry Cristiano has some lecture notes online. Uh, from a course that he's given, um, and, and, and there's other references too, but these are quite, quite good, especially these books are pretty comprehensive. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk uh, very, very briefly about model solution. So I'm gonna, an example, here's an example model. Uh, and this model has already been uh, th so remember the first steps are formulating the model and then uh, obtaining the Euler equations and then log linearizing or linearizing or log linearizing and that's already been done here uh, and so this is a paper that was published by Gali Lopez Lido and Vallas in um, the JME in 2003 and so uh, they have uh, they have uh, equations for um, three potentially observable objects. Uh, there's, there's three potentially observable objects. There's inflation. Um, there's a, uh, a, a, an output or, or an output uh, act variable. Um, uh, there's an uh, interest rate, and then there's uh, some other unobserved uh, variables in the system. There's some um, technology shocks, uh, taste shocks, um, and a, a real interest rate uh, process. And so the um, the uh, uh, the uh, Pricing equation is uh, uh, a New Keynesian Phillips curve without uh, any of the lagged effects. So this is a straight Calvo pricing equation. Um, this is a monetary policy rule, a Taylor type monetary policy rule relating, uh, say, an output or an output gap to um, uh, and inflation to interest rates, and it builds in some lagged um, lagged um, uh, interest rate response. So some slow movement of uh, of, um, of the monetary authority to its target. <clears throat> And then an intertemporal consumption equation, this derived from the consumption uh, Euler equation, and uh, with a uh, with a budget constraint. So that's the that's a simple version of the model, uh, a simple version of a, a model like this. There's you know many, many more complicated ones than this that that are available, but this is the sort of thing that you would see. And I think so. What's noticeable about this? So what are the key features? The key features are that it's been linearized. So we'll work with the linear setup. Um, it's got some expectations built in, so the model involves some rational expectations, the expectation at time t of inflation next period, and then um, there's another output expectation equation. Uh, 
And then it's got some shocks. And these shocks are actually quite important. If you think about this from an econometric perspective, um, a, a, model with a, a model with fewer shocks than variables is going to produce a dynamic or stochastically degenerate system. So um, these shocks are going to play an important role uh, in terms of making the system uh, non-degenerate and something that you can actually take to the data. A stochastically degenerate system is completely inconsistent uh, with the data and wouldn't be supported uh, by any empirical exercise. Okay. Um, once you've got a linearized system, there's a variety of different ways to solve, uh, to solve out these systems. Um, and so uh, there's lots of methods, and these methods are old. Okay? So I'm not going to talk about that. Once you've done it, so here's what the solution looks like. So the solution is something that puts it into a linear state space model. And that linear state space model says that there's some state vector that observes, without loss of generality, if it observes according to a finite order process, we can always write it as a first order process by stacking things. So it, it, it evolves according to some first order autoregressive, vector autoregressive structure. Some of these elements of this state vector are going to be unobserved. A lot of them are going to be unobserved. Some of them are going to be potentially observable. So um, inflation would be one of these things in here. Uh, possibly, and that might be potent- that would be potentially observable. Um, the uh, there's a Mark talked about the common filter, and so if you think about this in a common filter framework, essentially what's happened here is at this point, since the whole model has been solved out, so that it is has current stuff depending upon past stuff in a linear way, using a state vector notation. This is the state equation of the common filter. The common filter uh, setup is going to be completed by adding an observer equation. And the observer uh, equation says that this is some vector of observables. So in the previous example, we might observe some, say, output growth or some other measure of x, uh, inflation, and an interest rate. So we might have three things that we would observe. That's related linearly to the state vector. Basically, this H matrix would be a a matrix of zeros and ones that would select out elements of the state vector. And then potentially there's some measurement error. Depending upon how you set it up, there's some potentially some judgment about whether you would include, say, a measurement error term or whether that might be something that you'd build into the state equation. And so that's the common filter. Uh, that's the common filter setup. So the, the, the key point here is that this solved model is going to have uh, something that can map directly into this linear state space representation that, um, that is amenable to use by the common filter. Um, one point, which is an extension of a point that Mark made, but I'm going to just make it again uh, in, a, in this general setting, is that uh, this it's an old result of state space theory that a linear state space system such as this, where there's going to be some obser- unobserved elements of the state vector, um, will have a uh, VARMA, vector autoregressive moving average representation. So um, of where it's a finite order autoregression and a finite order moving average. So let me just show, go through that calculation in the simplest possible example. And so a, a simple example here is actually where we're looking at, um, whoops, this is a typo. So mu is, the, this, is a, this, this is supposed to be an S. Okay, so y is suppo- this is a permanent transitory model where y is the sum of a transitory bit and a permanent bit. And the permanent bit, this is supposed to be s, uh, evolves according to a random walk. So this is, this is uh, you were looking at models like this where this might be a slowly evolving mean uh, with some noise on top of it. This model here is written in state space form. There's two unobserved there's two unobserved things. There's two shocks. There's one observable. This thing has a uh, MA1 representation in first differences. And the way to see that is, con- is just take the first difference of Y. The first difference of Y is the first difference of this thing, which is S, which is simply eta. So it's eta plus delta epsilon T. Um, so that just says if you compute the variance of delta Y, it's going to be the 
variance of this plus then two times the variance of this from the delta. If you compute the covariance, um, if these things are uncorrelated, which they are for this calculation, then the covariance is just going to come from the dependence of epsilon t and epsilon t minus 1, and that's going to give you a covariance of minus sigma squared epsilon. And after you've gone more than one period lagged, you have no uh, correlation at all. So this is an MA1 structure. The first, it has a variance and one autocovariance that's not zero. All the other autocovariances are zero. So it's an MA1 in first differences or an ARIMA 0, 1, 1. Uh, in, in levels. So um, that's just an example. The more general result for a state space system here is that, it satis- is that it's a finite order vector autoregressive moving average system. Um, I think there's some relevance to that, or this comes up in these discussions. This MA bit matters. You can see the MA bit is actually the only interesting part of what's going on in this example. So if you're trying to approximate uh, one of these models by a finite order of vector autoregression, that approximation is bound to be an approximation. Um, it might be a good one or it might not be a good one, but it's going to be an approximation. Okay. <clears throat> so once you've, uh, once you've got it in the state space form, you can actually do a whole bunch of work uh, on this model. You can do many of the things that you're interested in. You can construct impulse response functions. So an impulse response function, for example, you can just suppose you're interested in, these are, these are going to be structural shocks here. So suppose you're interested in a, the effect of a structural shock. You can just feed it through this system. The S's are going to evolve, and then the Y's are going to evolve according to this. And then you can just pick out the effect on the Y's of the structural shock uh, eta. So you can do a lot of calculations uh, once it's in this, um, once it's in this uh, form. Um, um, there we go. Okay, so you can do a lot of calculations once it's in this uh, forum. You can you can simulate data. So if you wanted to compute some calculated complicated moments, you could compute complicated moments. So some complicated moments that people might compute would be impulse response functions, uh, uh, or um, you know, so you can just generate that through through the whole data, or you can simulate it if you want to compute higher moments for some reason. Okay. Um, okay. So this is just this is just the example in that Gali, Lopez, Salido, and Vallas model. Um, one way to set it up is uh, to imagine that you could observe r, pi, and x, and then the state vector is going to be the combination of the observables and the unobservables, and then the f's are going to be the result of this uh, solved system. Okay, so let me talk now for the rest of the talk. What I'm going to do is actually talk about inference and econometrics in uh, DSGE models. Okay. Um, So a variety of methods that have been used um, or could be used here are GMM, simulated GMM, maximum likelihood, and Bayes. Okay, so let me uh, talk about those in order. All right, so GMM we've spoken about quite a bit. Uh, There are actually three different ways that you could use GMM here. Uh, One of the ways you would use GMM is by estimating Euler equations one at a time. So we've looked at that in the context of uh, yesterday afternoon in the context of estimating a hybrid New Keynesian Phillips curve. So this is so we talked about that. That was uh, um, this literature. Uh, uh, this this literature that um, uh, that is reviewed in that Kleiberg and Mavridis um, survey paper, for example. Um, and so that's just estimating uh, estimating an Euler equation, a linearized Euler equation using or a linearized. A linearized uh, in this case, the new Keynesian Phillips curve using a uh, using lag values as instruments. Um, so uh, this slide is just for completeness. We did this uh, yesterday, uh, and this is just uh, how you would set up and, and do the uh, GMM estimation in this in this uh, setting. And then the usual asymptotics uh, would give you this uh, normal distribution. Okay, so we've talked about all of those things um, uh, already yesterday, so I'm not going to spend any more time on that. I guess one thing I would note uh, is that it's, as a matter of principle, possible to estimate the whole system uh, 
by GMM. Um, so to the uh, extent that there's these instruments are generated because of expectational errors, uh, then the expectational errors are all going to be um, martingale different sequences, and that says that previous values of data could be used as instruments for, um, for all of these different equations. So one could imagine gaining efficiency by, or doing the entire estimation by uh, GMM and obtaining efficient estimation uh, that way. Um, that's not the way that it's typically done, but um, I guess one comment that I'll come back to at the end, the, the most interesting part, of, looking way ahead, look, the most interesting part of this whole area is the, the, the techniques that are being applied for estimating these models are mm, relatively standard techniques of GMM and moment matching and uh, maximum likelihood. But what's really interesting uh, and makes this problem interesting from an econometric and tricky from an econometric point of view is that there's some really serious issues of identification in these models and, and, um, and we don't have good tools for understanding the identification issues I think in maximum likelihood context or at least as good tools as we do in GMM. So an interesting, so I'm just su an interest, a suggestion or an idea, maybe not even a suggestion, is thinking about a system GMM estimation because at least we have more tools for thinking about um, identification issues in um, GMM at least for now. So this is, that's sort of a, a GMM-related comment. OK. Um, so, so why would you want to use system GMM? Um, it's in part, uh, uh, I mean, it's mainly, the main reason is that you would be able to get, um, uh, you would get uh, efficiency uh, compared to individual equations. Um, but, uh, but potentially, you'll have some efficiency loss relative to maximum likelihood. I should mention that the setup that I have here for GMM, um, if you have errors that are serially correlated, that's going to induce um, additional efficiency losses because you'll need to use further lags of the uh, instruments depending upon the setup. Okay. So GMM can also be used in just the old-fashioned method of moment setting uh, for uh, matching for matching moments. So um, one of the econometric ideas that's been proposed is instead of estimating DSGE parameters by maximum likelihood or by system GMM, you might match only a few moments of interest. And this, I suppose, conceptually goes back to the old idea of to the idea of calibration, where you would just try to select a few moments. If you select enough moments, then you might want to do something a little bit more formal and um, estimate things by GMM. Uh, so uh, an example of that is this Christiano Eichenbaum Evans JPE paper, uh, which um, estimates a structural vector autoregression and identifies one shock, a monetary policy shock, and then tries to match that impulse response function to impulse res to the uh, that it is obtained empirically to impulse response functions that are um, obtained from the uh, DSGE, and then see if that provides enough information to estimate the parameters. Um, so that's that technology is actually pretty straightforward uh, application of uh, of uh, GMM, where you would have a moment that would be depending upon. Uh, that would be em empirical, which is, or a function of the data, which is uh, this empirical impulse response from an SVAR, and then you're matching that to an impulse response uh, from the theoretical model, the DSGE. Um, a technical aside, uh, a technical aside is that matching, so this is, if you think about matching an impulse response function, if you're doing it over a lot of horizons, this is actually a really a reasonably large moment vector. And then there's a question about how many moments you would actually want to use. And there's a, one paper that provides an information criterion selection approach to try to think about how to improve that uh, or to get around the problem of actually using too many moments when some of those moments are providing very little information. OK. <clears throat> OK, so simulated GMM. So 
the, situ- the situations that I've just talked about for uh, I talked about for applying GMM are situations in which these models would uh, de- deliver analytically implementable moment conditions, like the New Keynes and Phillips curve conditional expectation equation or a consumption cap M uh, ex- expecta- expectational equation. Uh, you can write down examples in which um, you don't get you don't get those um, convenient analytical expressions, uh, but you still can generate data from the model, and you'd want to uh, maybe match moments um, using a GMM approach. So, uh, in the New Keynes and Phillips curve equation, for example, uh, let's suppose that there's one more variable in there, which is a cost push uh, shock, and you don't observe the cost push shock, and it might have some long dynamics, and uh, if that's and it's just some exogenous variable that you don't observe. Well, if that's the case, then because of the long dynamics, you're not really going to be able to implement an expectational error-based um, uh, GMM. But you can still simulate the whole system, and so you can still see how the system evolves. And because you can simulate the entire system, you can compute a variety of different moments, and you can try to match those moments to empirical moments. And so. That approach uh, is something called simulated uh, GMM, or simulated method of moments. And so I thought I would spend a minute just talking about uh, the approach of simulated method of moments, because there's some aspects that are a little bit unusual, um, a little bit unusual, for at least for macroeconomists who haven't seen this before. Okay, so I'm going to give you a very simple so. I'm going to give you a really simple example of simulated method of moments. All right? So, 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 so this is a, you're going to be, you have to suspend belief. You, you're really, this is, you have to be really dumb to use this estimator. All right? So you, somebody tells you that you have some data that's normally distributed around a mean and a variance. And they even tell you the variance. So the variance is 1. And your job is to estimate the mean of the normal with the variance being 1 using a sample of data. Now, you know, I think when my daughter was in fifth grade, I think they worked on sample averages. And so you would just compute the average. But suppose you don't know how to compute a sample average, but you know how to use the computer. All right? So, so we're going to do something really idiotic. All right, so here's the idiotic thing we're going to do. Say, oh, I know what a normal is. I know a normal random jo- number generator in the computer. I don't know any statistics, but I know probability in computing. So I know the normal random number generator in the computer, how to, how to run it in the computer. So I'm going to draw random normals. All right, so I then get a vector u of random normals, I, I d normal zero ones. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to then compute the mean of that uh, of that uh, simulated data. All right, so I'm going to compute the the mean of that simulated data. So I take the vector u, I add to it a number, I then compute the mean of that. And now what I want to do is I want to choose that number such that the mean of my simulated data is as close as possible to the mean of the actual data. Does, does this make sense? I, I probably haven't explained this very well. It's, it's a, such, a dumb, such a simple example, you can't imagine why you would do it. <laughs> All right? So, so I, what I'm wanting to do, so what I'm really wanting to do is I have a distribution here in the real world that's normal with some mean, and I'm going to take some data of the same length, maybe, and I'm going to have that normal with another mean, and then I'm going to compute the average of this and compute the average of this and see if they're close to each other. And I want to adjust the mean of this thing so that these two averages are close to each other. Well, now, what I've done is really stupid because I could have just computed the sample average, and I didn't need to add all that noise. I've added noise to the problem. All right, so, but the way, so here's how this works. All right, so the simulated method of moments estimator, then what I'm going to do is this x bar is the random normals that I've generated the computer with this mean, and y bar is in the data, and I'm going to say I want these two moments, that's the sample moment of the data, to be as close to the 
to the moment of the artificially generated data, which is a function of theta, using a quadratic loss function. All right, well, in this particular case, this sample average of the data is very simple. It's u bar, it's the average of my artificially generated data from the computer plus theta. So I want to minimize this thing. All right, and so if I go through this in a grid search numerically, what I will do is because I don't know calculus, so I'm just going to go through it in a grid search and I'm going to numerically minimize this thing, and it turns out then I'm going to minimize this at y bar minus u bar. Okay, so that's going to be my minimizer. So my estimator from simulated method moments will be what I should have used all along, and then I've got noise added in. And the noise added in is because of this, because of the way I simulated the data, you know. If I subtract theta hat minus the true value, okay, well, y bar is a normal centered at the true value. So it's going to be y bar minus theta, but then I've got this additional noise. So what's, the, what's that mean? So basically, what have I got? I've got a normal here, and then I've got the additional noise of a normal. And how much noise do I have in this normal? Well, it depends on how many observations I drew in my computer. And if I drew m observations in my computer, then this is going to be, you know, this is going to have a normal distribution. And this will have a normal distribution. And in fact, if I'm drawing the data in my computer using the same known variance for the error term, these two normals will be the same. Uh, uh, with uh, These two normals will have the same distribution, which is normal 0 sigma squared. So when I put all these pieces together and I add these two normals together, oh, this S is supposed to be a kappa. When I add these two normals together, which they're, they're independent, so I get a normal 0 and then uh, sigma squared y, but then I have this additional factor. Well, this additional factor depends upon the amount of simulated data that I used. So if my simulated, the ratio of the number of observations in my simulation to my actual sample size is kappa, then I have this additional adjustment factor of 1 plus 1 over kappa times my variance. And that's the penalty that I have to pay for using this idiotic procedure of generating this u, adding to it theta, and then doing a grid search to find the best value of theta. And I didn't need to add to it all that fake data that made life worse for me. And, the reason, and it made life worse for me by a penalty factor of 1 plus 1 over kappa. Okay, so you know where this is going. I certainly didn't have to do this in this example. But in some examples, you might have to do this. And this is the variance you get. It's the standard GMM or GMM variance with a penalty factor of 1 plus 1 over kappa. And the reason that you get that 1 over 1 plus 1 over kappa is essentially this. Okay, so what's the GMM asymptotics going to be? You're basically going to take some really complicated function of some high dimensional parameter vector that doesn't have this nice property of just addition. But if it's locally local parameterization, you can linearize everything. There's going to be some derivative in there. The derivative is going to be the same as the derivative of this true bit because you're generating the data under the correct model. And if you're using the right error variance matrix, an efficient way to generate it, the co two pieces are going to have the same uh, the same uh, covariance matrix. They're going to be independent because one's in the real world and one's on the computer. You add them together and you get this factor. Right, so that's, that's simulated GMM. That's simulated GMM. It's right here. Right? So it's optimal GMM, efficient GMM with this additional factor. Okay. Um, so the way I described it, uh, and the way it's actually done, the way it would actually be done in DSGE models, uh, is exactly as I described. Um, one comment is that this little factor, this nice formula here, doesn't always apply, and problems come up if you're looking at um, problems can come up. They don't have to. It depends on how you do things. So. Uh, Digression. If you want to do things when variables are discrete or you have complicated problems with discontinuities, then you may or may not get this answer and you may or may not want to do it this way and you should read a textbook on this 
okay? But that's not relevant for us because uh, we're working in situations where the variables are continuous and the objective functions are continuous. Okay, comment number, comment number two is uh, instead of drawing a single long, long, long path and then computing the population moment from that, or from the fake data with a single long path, you might choose to compute a, a bunch of paths all of the same sample size. And the reason you might think of doing that is, I mean, suppose you're trying to match an AR coefficient in, or auto, impulse responses in vector autoregressions. We know those have finite sample bias. So you might do a better job of approximating the sample, the relevant sample moment that you're supposed to fit by generating a bunch of T-length observations on each one you fit uh, of an impulse response and then you average them together rather than computing one long data set and then computing the impulse response. You might do a little bit better on the, on the, sample, on the finite sample bias. Um, I think that's a folk theorem, not a theorem theorem. Um, uh, an, another comment um, on this is in terms of how you do it. This is actually... This is actually important. If you understand, if you understand this comment, then you understand this procedure. You should use the same seed every time you go back for a new theta. So seed means random number generator seed. So the random number generator seed, if I if if I set the random number generators, they're not random numbers. They're, uh, they're, they're computed by some algorithm, and that algorithm has to start somewhere, and that's uh, the seed that you use to start the algorithm uh, to compute these random number generators. You can control the sequence. If you just compute from Gauss or MATLAB or whatever a random number generator, a random number, it's going to be a different number every time. But if you set the seed to be 27, and then you compute the random number, and you set the seed again to be 27, it's going to compute the same number each time. That is, it's going to replicate the random numbers that are going to be produced by your random number generator. You want to do that in this setting, and the reason is that suppose that you move theta. Let's go back to this dumb example. Suppose I've tried a value of theta, and I said that's not my favorite value of theta. I'm going to try another value of theta. And I'm going to try that value of theta by adding u bar to theta and then computing my objective function. If I, for, if I change theta just a little bit and I compute an entirely new set of random numbers, then I'm going to get this objective function is going to change in a huge way. So I, it's, it's, in fact, not even going to be continuous. Or to be precise, it's not going to be stochastically equicontinuous, which is what you need. Okay. So to make it continuous in theta, you actually want to use the same u bar every time. So it's the same random number generator seed. So, so that's going to allow you to achieve a maximum. That maximum is not going to be at the right place because you're using u bar. You've thrown in this, this random stuff. The fact that it's not necessarily at the right place, sometimes it's going to be too big, sometimes it's going to be too little, it's going to be corrected by this factor. If you use tons of M, if M is like M is 100 times T, this factor is negligible. If you use a really short simulation, it's going to make a big difference. Right? So that's simulated method of moments. Okay. Maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood... I th- I th- you guys should know, I think you know how to, you know how to do this, right? Because remember, we linearized, the, we, the, the model has been linearized or log linearized. It's written in state space form after it's been solved. So if it's in state space form, you can apply the common filter. The common filter can compute, among other things, the log likelihood. So these are the common filter equations from Mark's slides. I just block copied them. And then this is the log likelihood from our slides. And you just, so one of the things, if you run the common filter, one of the things you could choose to compute is the log likelihood. So you've got essentially a subroutine or a function or a proc where you're passing it the data and theta, and it's coming back with the log likelihood. All right, so that's, and, 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 and built into that are the system matrices, H's and F's and sigmas and all of that. Those are, in a very complicated way, functions of the underlying deep parameters of the DSGE. 
So you come back with a log likelihood for a trial value of theta. Right? You don't like that value of theta. You then pass it another value of theta, and you, so forth. And then you maximize the log likelihood. So that's really all there is to it. Um, this is just a formula for the usual asymptotic variance of the uh, the usual asymptotic variance of the uh, quasi maximum likelihood estimator. Um, quasi maximum likelihood allows for the pa- possibility that perhaps there's some misspecification in the likelihood uh, in in the likelihood function. <coughs> um, <coughs> There is a, this, is, this is completely non-trivial in the uh, context this is completely non-trivial in the context of uh, DSGE estimation because of, uh, because these likelihoods can be fairly complicated, and we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, we'll come back to that. OK. Uh, finally, Bayes estimation. All right. So let me so Bayes estimation actually, I think I don't know the first people who did it. Um, but certainly that was an important part of the Smets uh, Routers paper, and it's ve- and a very important part of it's probably the, the the dominant method, I guess, in this literature for estimation of uh, DSGE models. And so I'm going to talk about that um, talk about that a bit. Um, okay. Um, so a little bit of Bayes basics. Um, the basic idea of Bayes uh, procedures is you're treating the uh, you're conditioning on the data and you're going to treat the parameters as uh, random variables. So if they're random variables, they have to have a distribution. And until you look at the data, their distribution is your prior distribution pi. Um, what you're interested in doing is using Bayes law to compute a posterior distribution of uh, a theta. Uh, to, excuse me, to compute the distribution of theta given all of the data. And the way you do that is um, is through uh, is through um, is through um, Bayes uh, law, and then you might be interested in computing the uh, a number of objects uh, there, but th- uh, a number of objects. But primarily, I guess you'd be interested in computing a posterior mean, um, which uh, is usually the uh, usually the Bayes estimate. Although I'll digress, uh, uh, some. I think that pri- primarily for numerical reasons, sometimes the mode of the posterior distribution is reported. Um, but, I, but, but usually, I guess, the recommended Bayes procedure is to compute the posterior mean. Uh, the posterior mean is just the mean of the posterior distribution. OK. Um, so, so the implementation of these methods um, is you know, when you when you learn when when you're first taught Bayes methods, you work in a normal problem where you then have a conjugate prior, and then you can do this. Uh, you can do all of the work uh, analytically, and you can um, and you can compute uh, posterior means um, just by uh, analytic integration of uh, posterior distribution, and and that's in general not going to be uh, possible. And it certainly isn't possible in this uh, context. Um, so in this context, uh, integration has to proceed um, not by uh, analytic methods, but by numeric methods. Uh, one of the big breakthroughs in, I would say, one of the big breakthroughs in, in all of statistics, and Marcus talked about this, but one of the big breakthroughs in all of statistics in the last 15 years has been the development of fast methods for numerical integration that can be applied to very, very complicated Bayes problems. And this is what's often referred to as the MCMC revolution. Uh, the MCMC revolution is something that um, did not start with us. I mean, we are, you know, we're the last group to, to look at this. This is, this is huge in, uh, in genomics and in uh, applications, uh, signal processing, and applications where you have very, very large data sets where there's a structure that you can, can, put, can put or place on the entire data set, and it makes sense to have some sort of exchangeability type assumptions on this, uh, on this uh, data set, and you're not going to be able to implement um, frequentist methods uh, in a very um, convenient uh, fashion, uh, and instead you can implement some of these Bayes methods through these uh, numerical uh, techniques. Um, this is actually an example where these Bayes numerical techniques make a lot of sense because although we can compute the likelihood, and the likelihood is uh, a function of the parameters, we don't have any. It, that likelihood is really a nasty object. We can only compute it. Uh, we can only compute it numerically. It's a nasty object in terms of its function, functional relationship to the deep parameters. 
And so we don't have any way that we can do analytic integration. In the, remember the, post, the textbook problem with the normal and the conjugate prior, you, you know, those parameters like worked out and you could play games in the, in the exponent of the normal and then you could do an integration and then you get an answer. Um, but that's not available to us when we only have a numerically evaluated likelihood. And, uh, and so instead, uh, these numerical techniques are used for numerical integration. You know, numerical integration is not a big mystery. I mean, in principle, all you need to do is, if you have a prior and you have your, uh, uh, if you have the object that you, if you have your prior and you have your likelihood, all you need to do is basically sample from the entire space of the, of the of theta, and then you evaluate what those things are going to be, and then you do your integration. But the problem is the dimensionality is really high, and that would be incredibly inefficient computationally. So uh, in high dimensional systems, this is what the MCMC revolution is: is there's techniques that have been developed for doing that very very efficiently, and um, those are embodied in um, in in those, those are what are used in this literature. And they are, among other things, um, implemented in this. This software is one of the sets of software that I guess is used pretty frequently. Dynair uh, is used pretty frequently in this in, in to estimate these uh, MG, uh, excuse me DSGE models. And so that's implemented in 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 here. Okay. Once you've in the in the Bayesian framework, uh, once you've got your posterior, you can do a number of things. So you can do the mean or the mode. Uh, uh, the mode, I think the reason you want to do it is if you feel like you're not really sampling over the entire space and maybe you don't have a credible way to compute the posterior mean, you still might be able to find the highest point. Um, you can compute um, things called Bayesian credible sets, which are versions of confidence intervals. And I mentioned those, uh, mentioned those last time. Um, okay, so there's a, a very nice uh, survey and uh, primer on this uh, by Ann and uh, Shorefied in uh, 2007. Okay, so I thought I would digress a little bit. Um, to talk about um, Bayes' methods at a general level. So um, I think it's, it's easy. So here's one reason why you would want to be a Bayesian. A, a, a reason why a graduate student might want to be a Bayesian is that they want to do their research program and Dynar does MCMC, and that's what's in the published papers, so that's what they do. Okay, so that's one reason to be a Bayesian. But I think there's deeper reasons, either to or not to be a Bayesian, and I thought we would spend a few minutes talking about those. Okay, so... So I'm going to give you some reasons. These are all reasons that are put forward to be a Bayesian. I'm going to disagree with most of them, but I think some of them have merit. So here's the first one, and I'm going to disagree with this. It's something called the likelihood principle. So I'm going from the most extreme to the most practical. And this is the most extreme. There's an axiomatic reason to be a Bayesian. And the axiom, the axiom is, is that all inference should be based on uh, the likelihood function. So if two, two, if two data sets, so we, uh, let me say it precisely. All the relevant information in the data is embodied in the likelihood function. Two different mechanisms that will yield the same likelihood function should yield identical inferences. Now that sounds really plausible. But it's, and here's the counterexample, for me a counterexample. Okay, it turns out the, the following two Think about these following the two experiments that are written here. The first experiment is these are both this would both have to do with Bernoulli trials and they actually have to do with stopping rules for Bernoulli trials. So the first experiment is you give five patients an exp five patients an experimental drug and you observe whether they live or die. We're looking at the whether the drug has bad effects. Okay, so and you observe whether they live or die. And then we observe 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so we observe two successes, uh, deaths, and <laughs> three <laughs> failures, okay? I mean, you know what I mean. We observe two heads and three tails, 
okay? Experiment two has a different protocol. And the protocol is we're going to keep giving patients the drug until two of them die. Okay? And then it turns out that you get the fifth patient is the second one to die. And you have two heads and three tails. If you come from a frequentist perspective or if you're a doctor or a medical scientist and you think about experimental design, those are two very different experiments. Right? And, and actually, the, the FDA treats those experiments differently. There's a class of procedures in experimental design in the medical area where you would stop an experiment when there's a certain number of deaths and based on the fact that you stop it, you have to adjust your inference. And there's another way you just sort of proceed to the end of the experiment and you see who lives and dies or, or you know, the equivalent of Okay, And those are analyzed differently. There's, in a sense, sort of some selection bias is one way to think about it, by the ones where you stop early because people are dying. The likelihood principle would have you treat those two data sets exactly the same. And so you would not take into account that the fact that those experimental designs are different. Just drive the likelihoods. Okay? So... So I think, this is, I think this is one reason you could be a Bayesian, but I think it's a, not a good reason. That's an opinion. Okay. Here's another reason to be a Bayesian, which is in some ways a good reason, in some ways a less good reason, which is subjectivist Bayes decision theory. So So if you have to make a personal decision about your... Uh, investment, the best thing that you can do is you could use you can use your loss and all the available information to you and your prior information to make an optimal decision. And that will be the best thing for you to do. And, and to be more precise about it, the best decision that you can make for you is a Bayesian decision where you compute, where you minimize the expected loss computed with respect to your prior distribution. And that's a general principle of decision theory. And in fact, there's a huge literature on decision theory, um, which uh, has a very uh, substantial, uh, so let me go, actually, it has a very substantial conclusion, which is that all, in some specific sense, all optimal decisions are Bayes decisions. And I'll make that precise. All right, so, um, so here, I'm going to actually use this, I'm going to use all of this tomorrow uh, when I'm talking about forecasting, so let me just go through this. Here's a quadratic loss function. So here are the, th- the four elements, the four key elements of Bayesian decision theory. A loss function. So I'm going to be interested in making a p- decision about a parameter of theta, uh, and that's some true uh, value. A frequentist risk function says that if I have some estimator, uh, some estimator theta, then I am going to look at the expected value, where it's the expected value over the distribution of y given theta of my loss. Right? So the risk is the expected loss. In this case, it would be theta minus theta hat squared in the quadratic case. The Bayes risk, so this actually depends on the true value of theta. The Bayesian says, I actually don't care about this because I don't think there's such a thing as a true value of theta. I think that theta is a random variable, so I'm going to integrate this risk with respect to my prior distribution. So the Bayes risk is the frequentist risk integrated with respect to the prior distribution. And that's going to take into account how likely different outcomes, different thetas are, different states of the world are. The Bayes decision rule says I should choose my decision procedure, my estimator, my decision rule, to minimize my Bayes risk. Okay. That, so that's fine. So that's, and that is what the individual should do if you're making a decision for yourself with your loss function, with your prior information. The amazing result, or one of the, one of the basic results of decision theory, Bayesian decision theory, is this thing called the complete class theorem. The complete class theorem says that not only is it the best thing for you to do personally, but it says that any admissible decision rule is going to be either a Bayes rule, a Bayes decision rule, or a limiting limit of a Bayes decision rule. So um, what, what that says, that's actually a huge challenge to a frequentist perspective because it says that the best you can do is, is, is in a sense, being a Bayesian. Now, the key phrase here is admissibility, and admissibility 
says that um, your loss function is somewhere not do- your 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 risk function is somewhere not dominated. So um, essentially, what's going on here is where your risk function is not going to be dominated is the uh, on those priors that are putting great mass on 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 this one region. So that's sort of what's what's going on underneath it. But it does say that this is a logical reason to at least from a decision theoretic perspective uh, be a Bayesian. My view is that the, a, a problem with this approach is, um, is this prior distribution, and this makes sense from a subjectivist Bayes perspective. Um, if, if you're the decision maker, if you're the policy maker, if it's your money that you're investing, it's quite different if it's a scientific enterprise uh, where it's a matter of communicating information. Uh, this really is not the object. A, a scientific est- enterprise is not going to be minimizing the Bayes risk with respect to, say, your particular prior. Um, here's another comment, which is James Stein estimation. This is all also related to what I'll be talking about tomorrow. So it turns out that uh, frequentist, uh, that if you have a particular loss function, which is this uh, inner product loss function, so you're looking at the average squared deviation, um, that OLS under this loss function is actually inadmissible if the dimension of theta is at least three. And... Um, and you can actually construct estimators like a James Stein shrinkage estimator that is better, uniformly better than OLS. It's better, strictly better than OLS for some values of theta, and it's no worse everywhere else. And um, you can also achieve that using uh, Bayes estimators. So it says that OLS in this particular case is not even a, an estimator that under this loss function would be something you'd want to use. This is uh, in a way I will explain tomorrow, this is actually a loss function that's relevant for forecasting. Right? This is essentially a forecasting loss function. So this is, a, I think, a one, this is a first cut at a very good reason why if you're interested in forecasting, you might want to think of moving towards Bayesian procedures or shrinkage procedures. It's actually not at all the forecasting function, that we're in, the, the loss function we're interested in for DSGs. For DSG, basically what's going on here is you're willing to trade off uh, variance with bias, and so you're willing to say, I, I'm, I, I don't mind having a bunch of bias in some of my estimators if that's going to reduce the variance. I don't think that's where we are at all in a DSGE setting. I think a DSGE setting, where well, these are supposed to be deep parameters, right? So we'd want to know what that deep parameter is, and it's not clear that tra- we're willing to trade off a whole bunch of uh, bias uh, for an overall variance reduction of a forecast. Uh, I mean, this is a forecasting problem, not a parameter estimation problem. Okay. Priors formalize the use of prior knowledge. Well, this is in some sense true. Um, I, the only comment I would make on this, uh, the only retort I would make to this, is that, you know, when we say, so I suppose when we say we think beta is 0.99, a discount factor is 0.99, we have some reasonable way to, to think to think about that. When we say my prior knowledge based on previous research is that the Calvo parameter is something, okay? My guess is that all of that previous research was done on the same data set that you're fitting. No? You're disagreeing with me? They use microdata Well, if you can do that, then that's a, then that, so if you can use micro, so maybe that's not the best example. If you can use a micro data set to calibrate your prior, then that's actually an excellent motivation, all right? So that is really bringing in prior information, yeah. So, so th- that's fair too. So, gener- using information from other countries, using information from prior data. So those are those are completely le- legitimate. Okay. So I I agree with that. Um, okay. Another argument that's sometimes made is um, is this is an argument to be Bayesian. This is more an argument that doesn't matter anyway which is this Bernstein von Mises theorem. Okay, so what the Bernstein von Mises theorem says in related work says, loosely speaking, that inference based on um, a posterior is going, and posterior means is going to be essentially the same as inference based on the maximum likelihood estimator, at least asymptotically. 
uh, in a well-identified system. The, the trouble is, so this is actually completely correct, and we, in, a, in textbook examples like inference for the mean, you can just see how this drops out, that the prior um, uh, ceases to enter into the uh, inference um, if it's, uh, um, unless it's dogmatic um, in, 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 a, in a very straightforward way after you acquire enough information. Um, the concern about this in, in, in practice, so here's some other references about how this is also true for walled uh, hypothesis tests and confidence intervals and stuff like that. There is some delicacy to this result. There's an interesting paper in the Annals of Statistics by Friedman that talks about uh, high dimension problems of it. Um, I think what really is the issue here is, um, is, is actually in some sense, the opposite of the previous issue. Here, if you have information from prior uh, sources, you would actually want to bring that to bear. In this latter point, it says that that information should be irrelevant and that you should get the same inferences, whether you're a Bayesian or not. And I don't think that's necessarily the, the, the situation that one finds. Um, the f- a final point is that as a matter of convenience, and this is sort of the graduate student using Dinar, is that, it, this can, that you can solve identification problems using Bayes methods. Um, but um, whether if that identification is solved by using information that's truly obtained, say, from other data sources, that's one thing. But if it's just a mathematical device to get around um, a poor identification, that's quite another. So this has actually been, I, I didn't, you know, when I was writing these slides, I didn't realize it would sound so grumpy. Um, so, so, so I will give you. So the only thing I'll say, uh, the only thing I'll say is that tomorrow I'm going to give you a very. I'm going to take this this view and this view very seriously and provide you uh, with some uh, Bayesian a- as- a- angles on forecasting that are that are I think going to be quite remarkable and I think will be I think will be uh, new. Okay. Uh, okay, it's new, n- new to some of you at least. Okay, so, um, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Please, yes. So this, this, that question, is, that comment was related to the question of, of communication. And I, this is this is a long. That's a long digression. Is to think about what, um, what, what the issues are in terms of actual sci- scientific communication and scientific discourse. So if this just gets back to the question of sensitivity of priors to. Uh, to um, sensitivity of estimators to priors. And if you, produ- if you publish a table that has a posterior distribution that's based on your prior, if Bernstein von Mises applies so that your prior is irrelevant, then we all know how to interpret it. But if Bernstein von Mises doesn't apply so that your prior is informative, then it really becomes problematic because that's only providing one way to look at the data, and we need to see other ways to look at the data as well. Confidence intervals, plus or minus 1.96, I can do, we all run a confidence interval and we come back, 95% of us will have the right, the true value in our confidence set. We know what that means. So as a matter of scientific communication, it's well understood. Uh, and, and I think that's sort of, that's what seminars are, are, are able to, to handle in a convenient way. I, I think that this is more problematic uh, as a matter of communication, but that actually gets me to a point, a point here, okay, which is that there's our formal methods for handling handling this concern, and these formal methods are something called uh, robust Bayes theory, um, uh, which I am sure that many of the most sophisticated practitioners practitioners in this DSG area are familiar with, but. Um, but perhaps um, perhaps could get more uh, more play. So what robust Bayes is all about is it's about examining the sensitivity of your results to uh, the priors that you're using. And um, there's a couple of ways you can think about doing that. Of course, one way is to say I'm going to do a sensitive a robustness analysis, and so I'm going to change my prior a little bit, and I'm going to tr- or change it and do an, do one set of estimates with one prior and another set with another prior and produce two tables. 
But if you really want to be systematic and if the dimensionality is high, which of course it is, that's not very satisfactory because you don't want to produce 200 tables. And so there's actually some pretty interesting ideas that are available in the, um, in the robust Bayes literature where they've developed parametric and non-parametric methods with contaminated priors and bounds on priors and mixtures of priors and things like that that um, are, provide a formal way to look at uh, robustness. And I think that has some, some potentialities. Um, I'm going to come back to, I'll come back to empirical Bayes uh, tomorrow. All right, so let me talk a little bit about um, uh, identification and inference. I think the, one of the interesting things in this literature from an econometrics perspective, and it's clear that all of the papers and all of the practitioners are aware of it, is that there's really s- very interesting questions about identification uh, involved. And so I'm going to spend m- most of this time just talking about identification and DSGEs. And I, I, I um, so the, the thi- one of the things that's very interesting about it is that it's very hard to actually get a handle on this um, because the link between the parameters and the, the mapping from the deep parameters to the likelihood function is, is pretty complicated. And so it's very hard. You, there's really don't seem to be analytical tools to figure out whether things like Hessians or, or uh, you know, expected values of those are, um, are, uh, are singular or anything along those lines. So any of the, any of the ideas that we might bring to bear about um, identification are really complicated in this setting because the mapping is so nonlinear and it's so, no, it's so difficult to, to, to get a handle on. So, um, so there's, this is clearly a, consen- a theme in this literature. And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of approaches uh, a couple of, uh, first of all, try to document some of this and just show some of this evidence from this literature, try to highlight the nature in which this weak identification is clearly a problem, and then um, maybe talk about some ideas about how to uh, get around that. One of the ideas uh, is to think about GMM estimation because at least there's tools, such as the tools I talked about yesterday, that are available for estimation uh, and inference when you have weak identification. I'm not sure that's necessarily a great idea because you might be losing some efficiency, but at least it's one, one possibility, one possible direction to go. Another uh, possible system GMM. Another possible direction to go, and this is related to something I'll talk about tomorrow, which is to see if you can get an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude more data uh, from the macro uh, data uh, that's available, and that's using much, much larger data sets and this, the, this idea in this Bovan Giannone paper. So that would be essentially trying to, this first one is saying, okay, you've got weak identification. How can you do inference in it in a credible way? The second is uh, how can you get more information? All right, so I'm going to go through just three uh, examples of, uh, of some indications that there might be some weak identification here. And I, I'm so, this is, these are only I- examples. I, I, this is not, in, it's not like a, this is just not as worked out. I, it is not as worked out as the stuff I was talking about yesterday. So these are three indications that are out there in the literature that there are identification issues. Okay, so the first one is a paper by Canova and Sala, and um, there's a couple of versions of the paper. The early version had some problems, but I think they've been fixed in this version. Um, and this is just a, they did, he, they did a, a study of likelihood, of, excuse me, objective functions and, uh, and just a little bit of Monte Carlo simulation of what happened, of of, of a GMM estimation where you're doing a moment matching, an impulse, respo- impulse response function matching exercise uh, using a small uh, three equation uh, DSGE that's very much like that um, Gali, Lopez, Salido, Valles uh, DSGE, and then matching it to impulse response functions. And the only thing that I am going to show you from that paper is this one plot of uh, objective function contours. And the thing that's interesting about this plot of these objective function contours, and this is at a pretty fine grade, is that these are pretty non-quadratic. So if you think, if you go back to thinking about the GMM expansion that we did the other day from the perspective, yesterday, from the perspective of the objective function, uh, what we were focusing on or hoping for, for the large sample asymptotics to be good, is for the uh, the curvature 
to, for the objective function to be well approximated by a normal with a non-random matrix. Now, this is just one realization, so we can't say anything about whether it's a non-random curvature or how well that approximation is, but we can at least look at whether it seems to be an approximately quadratic approximation. And at least in some of these, some of these dimensions, it seems as though there's some reasonable curvature that give some evidence of this surface not being well approximated by a quadratic. That's let me give you another, another hint in the same direction. Another hint in the same direction. Um, and this is a Monte Carlo study that uh, Anna uh, Makusheva did. Um, if there's anything wrong with it, I'll take all the blame. Um, the, uh, and this is a variant of this um, Galli Lopez Salido Fallis model. Uh, and this was run using Dynar, uh, and uh, it was an ML estimation uh, procedure. So a, it's a Monte Carlo study of this, uh, of this, um, of this model, uh, which has 11 parameters. Two of these parameters were fixed, so the discount factor was fixed at 0.99. This elasticity was fixed at 1, and, uh, and the other parameters were uh, estimated. So it only had nine estimated parameters. Um, it has three shocks. And it has three observable, uh, we treated three variables as observed, pi, r, and x, and, uh, and, and wanted to see what we got. And so, what we, and so this is, these are just the parameter values. Um, very small number of Monte Carlo rep- repetitions, but enough to get some sense as to what's going on, I think. Um, looked at a number of different things, which is the, uh, uh, looked at a maximum likelihood estimator uh, for um, each element of uh, theta fixing the others at the true. And so that's just one way to see whether there's something really bizarre going on. This should work pretty well. If you fix everything else at the true and it's a one-dimensional problem, it should work pretty well, and it does. And then we looked at unrestricted MLEs and t-statistics and coverage rates. Um, So this is the situation that should work, which is fixing one coefficient at a time where, uh, excuse me, estimating one coefficient at a time where all the others are fixed. And in fact, uh, these work really well. The walled statistic has size that's right around 5%. Remember, this has got a very small number of draws, so this is just great. Um, It has virtually no bias, so the MLE is just working uh, perfectly well in this very simple uh, setting. Um, The more complicated and the more interesting setting is when all of the parameters are estimated. So these are the parameters in the uh, Taylor rule. This is the uh, uh, lagged value of uh, interest rates in the Taylor rule. Um, is the Calvo pricing parameter. Um, these are some, uh, some uh, persistence parameters. And then these are uh, the shock variances. And uh, so this is based on, um, on uh, maximum likelihood estimation uh, of all of the parameters. And what you see is that you start to see some really significant size distortions for the t-statistics. So for example, some of the worst behaved Happen to be these um, have to be these Taylor rule coefficients where the size of the five percent significance T test is you know 40, 25, 46 percent. Um, in some instances, it seems to be working okay. In other instances, it's working uh, really quite poorly in terms of the size of the T statistic. Part of the problem is that the coefficients seem to be pretty biased. Um, so, for example, this um, coefficient on lagged uh, out an output in the um, in the Taylor rule uh, equation uh, is 0.15. The bias is 0.44, so it's huge bias. It's huge bias on the uh, coefficient on price, uh, on, on inflation as well. Some of these seem to have much less bias. Um, you know Why that is, I don't know. Um, the standard errors seem to be messed up as well. So between the bias and the standard errors, the t-statistics are wrong uh, in a substantial way, and the confidence intervals are um, off by quite a bit. Um, this is some distributions of t-statistics with this very small number of observations. Some of them look you know, reasonably normally distributed. Some of them don't look very normally distributed. So, uh, so you know, this is a small number of MC draws, so it needs to be done more carefully, or more thoroughly, I should say. I think it was done carefully, but not completely. Um, but, but it gives you some flavor that there's some uh, issues involved. This is distributions of these estimators. They're supposed to be normally distributed. Uh, Not all of them look normally distributed. Okay, so let me make a few final comments uh, here. Um, I think 
so a few final comments, um, I think, that, and, and references. So I, I, this literature is really exciting, and it's really interesting, and there's an awful lot of um, important developments of, in it. Most of those developments are, tech, a lot of those econometric developments are technical. How do you evaluate the posteriors? How do you do develop nonlinear um, solutions to these models? There's some evidence that the nonlinear solutions um, are going to yield better identification than the linear models. Um, so there's a lot of interesting numerical work that goes in to this. I think there remains to be a lot of interesting numerical work, uh, and a lot of interesting work on the econometrics and the inference side of this as well. Um, and uh, um, I, I don't have, I, unfortunately, of all of the things, of all of the different talks, I don't have any clear recommendations coming out of this other than this general warning, and I guess of all of the different things that we looked at, maybe doing Monte Carlo studies seems to be a particularly a good idea, and producing those, if you're going to do the Bayesian route, producing those posterior prior plots like uh, Smets and Vowders did seems to be a particularly helpful way to communicate where you're getting information from the model and where you're not. Okay, so thanks, uh, thanks very much, and I'll see you tomorrow afternoon.